CHI was founded in 1993 as an independent organization devoted to researching and advocating for policies to advance the interests of California's biomedical community. We are headquartered in San Diego with offices in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento. For the better part of 20 years, we've partnered with our friends at PricewaterhouseCoopers to produce the yearly California Biomedical Industry Report, a report that takes a holistic look at the economic pulse and impact of the life sciences ecosystem in California. From current employment trends, industry wages, venture capital funding levels, NIH grants, the product development pipeline, and more, this report is a time-tested and reliable source used by legislators at the federal and state level, as well as stakeholders and opinion leaders from across the industry to make decisions. Today, we'll highlight the important roles that biomedical R&D and manufacturing contribute to California's economy and ultimately the nationwide life sciences ecosystem. We're also pleased to be joined by a panel of industry experts to provide you with context on what this new data means for our industry. Our panelists include Rick Winningham, Chairman and CEO of Therafance Biopharma. Rick also serves as CHI's Board Chairman. We're also joined by CHI Board Members Don Bobo, the Corporate Vice President of Heart Valve Therapy for Edwards Life Sciences, and Peter Claude, partner at PwC and co-author of this report. It is our hope that by the end of this webcast, you will have a better understanding of the current economic state of our industry and the trends to expect in the near future. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit those into the questions tab at the lower right-hand side of your webinar control panel. We look forward to addressing those with the panelists during the Q&A portion of our webcast after Peter and I present the report's key findings. Our full report is also available at chi.org slash 2015 biomed report. A hyperlink is also included in the chat box on your control panel. Now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Peter Claude, our report co-author and partner at PwC's Pharmaceutical and Life Sciences Advisory Division, as he will take us through the report's key findings. Peter? Thanks, Todd. California really does hold a unique position in the world life, life sciences community, and this is clear in the data on this slide. We'll delve into a number of these points later in the report, um, but it, one thing is for sure is that the life science corporate leaders in California have made the state's life sciences industry an economic juggernaut. Just a few statistics from 2013 bear that out. As the industry produced the second highest employment in, the, in California, right behind the computer and peripheral equipment manufacturing industry. A lot of people associate California with motion pictures and with internet, but they don't really appreciate that the biomedical industry is really the second largest employer in the private sector. In addition, we have over 2,600 life science companies in California, the vast majority of that being small entrepreneurial privately held companies. When we look back at 2011, there was some interesting data. The employment has gone up slightly, but the number of companies has grown over 15 percent, and that just reaffirms the fact that there continue to be a large number of activity in the growth and development stage companies. Moving on. So what we see in the state is a tremendous confluence of innovative thinking, hard work, and funding that's created this powerhouse. And as you see, the employment is all through the state, with the Bay Area continuing to lead the charge with the highest number of employees, uh, followed closely by Los Angeles and Orange County. But these aren't just regular jobs. These are also very high-paying jobs. The average, in 2013, the average salary for these people was a little bit over 100000 about $101,000. And the positive thing is, is that when you go back to 2011, that's grown from almost $76,000. So not only has the jobs, number of jobs increased, but also the, the salaries and therefore the taxes and the benefits accruing to the state of California. So a tremendous result there. But it's not just the people who work for the industry directly for these companies who are contributing to the overall health and growth inside of California. Moving on. In addition to those 270,000 workers, 
the indirect and induced employment, that is everyone who works with this industry, whether it be construction workers who help to build plants, computer programmers who build software for companies to use specifically in life sciences, consultants like myself, people who serve this industry adds almost another half million, do half million jobs to the economy. So between the two, it's over three quarters of a million jobs in the state of California are due to the life sciences industry and the benefits that it produces for its uh, for the people. And these are not just regular jobs, as I said, they are relatively good paying jobs. And th that results in, in benefits to the state, both through state taxes as well as to the federal government through federal taxes. And that's almost 10, almost $11 billion in taxes are being paid by these companies and these employees. So a tremendous return for the governments involved. The industry is not just large and growing and significant to the state of California, it is also very resilient. As we all know, this has, not been a this has not been an easy time for our economy over the past number of years, and even not for our industry, which has been under a significant amount of stress. But the wonderful thing to see about the state of California is despite everything that's occurred in the industry, despite everything that's occurred in the economy, we have continued to see employment growth um, over that time, which when you consider the size and the base of the employees in this market is a tremendous accomplishment. Um, you, looking down the chart, you see certainly a large number of swings, both positively and negatively. Um, certainly swings towards the top indicate, you know, are indicative of the change in, in restructuring and employment and mergers and acquisitions activity. But California continues to lead that charge with growth on a very, very large pace. Moving on. And it's not just in terms of numbers of employees and in sizes of companies. All of, that gener all of that is a result of a large amount of NIH funding. And again, here, California is a leader in the market. Um, when you look at what we uh, were able to receive during the year of 2013 and 2014, um, almost $3.3 billion in NIH funding, um, and also a large number of tech transfer grants which is total about 146 million. Who's pulling that here? It's the UC system really is driving the vast majority of those NIH grants. When you look at the top four, basically unchanged um, in terms of who's receiving the money, except the fact that the numbers have increased slightly. And when you look at the total number of, of grants received, it's, it's tremendous to see that even after nine months, which is the 2014 data with a 3.3 billion, number that we are already ahead of the 12-month figure for 2013 of 3.2 billion. And again, the, the states that follow us, pretty consistent as well with the prior years. But the nice thing is, even with all the budget constraints that we've had, the sequestration issues of the prior years, we have continued to hold on to the lion's share of NIH funding. And that funding is, is creating a lot of good. Um, the pipeline in California continues to be extremely strong. Cancer clearly leads the number of products that are being developed um, in, the, in the biopharmaceutical area. Uh, over 1,200 INDs were filed in California in, 300, in 2014, so that money is definitely being put to good use. Um, and this, again, only relates to data coming out for the biopharmaceutical area because of the, the, the fact that that data is better and more accessible than, for example, the colleagues in the medical device side of things. Um, the, when you look across down the therapeutic areas, again, a lot of them dealing with unmet medical needs and, and horrible conditions that are affecting uh, everyone in society today. Uh, the nice thing is, is that you've seen a continued growth in the number of products. Uh, in fact, in 2011, the cancer uh, number of products in development for cancer was only about 250. Uh, so again, nice to see that growth there. Continuing the story, uh, a lot of that money, as I mentioned, the NIH grants are flowing into uh, the UC system as well as the other significant uh, entities and universities in California. Uh, why is that? Because those entities are world class. Uh, the investment that's been made in those institutions, uh, both privately and publicly, has continued to pay off in terms of not only the demand that uh, comes in from a money perspective, but also the type of students and the type of degrees that are coming out. Uh, California continues to lead the U.S. in terms of the number of life science doctoral degrees that come out, um, and we continue to lead the, the, uh, the U.S. in terms of number of industries. 
And the, the important thing coming out of that is that we were able to keep those people in California um, in order to be able to generate the success we've talked about on previous slides. So we've talked through a number of different areas. Um, we've talked about education. Um, that leads to doctorates. It leads to brains. Those lead to good ideas. Um, those good ideas uh, pull in NIH grants, and that creates good science. And what does that good science create? A magnet for investment. When you look at the, when you look at the venture capital funding that's come in um, over the past year, uh, California, again, continues to receive the lion's share of that at 45%. Um, and uh, again, similar to the employment figures, it's our, the investment in life sciences is only second to the investment in technology, which is, which is uh, very important when you consider that the, the payback from a technology perspective is usually a lot quicker, yet people continue to see the value in life sciences and continue to make that significant investment here. Not only are people making investments from a VC standpoint, the M&A market is, continues to be strong and is even on a pace to eclipse 2013 with over 70 deals, over $34 billion, where the target company was located in California. And we're blessed to see that the number of IPOs remains strong. In fact, we had a very strong uh, quarter in the third quarter. Uh, but when you look at 2014, uh, 20 IPOs for California companies, billion and a half of, of proceeds. Companies um, like Fibrogen, New Nevro, and Versardis are just examples of companies that have been able to take advantage of that market. And we still continue to see that being a fairly strong and vibrant um, opportunity for many companies these days. So that's, the, that's basically the summary on the, uh, on the data. Now that you've had a chance to see the highlights and the key findings from the, the 2015 report, I'd like to turn this back to Todd Gillenwater to be able to walk us through the public policy implications in both Washington and Sacramento on our industry. Thank you, Peter. So as you've just seen over the past uh, number of slides and throughout our report, the strength of our state's life sciences, biomedical, R&D sector remains strong. However, a word of caution is, is certainly always in order. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Again, California is still very strong. Calif the ingredients within California uh, a strong uh, research infrastructure at our state's research universities and research institutes, um, the risk-taking entrepreneurship culture of our state uh, continues to remain strong in California and is one of the most significant reasons why California continues to lead the pack. However, California also continues to face increasing competition from other states around the nation and other countries around the world. So for in order for the California biomedical ecosystem to remain strong, the role of policies and policy makers in both Washington, D.C. and in Sacramento must continue to be focused on maintaining, strengthening, and bolstering the environment for biomedical research investment and innovation. For just a few examples at the federal level, in a focus of, of CHI in Washington with our congressional delegation, federal policies must continue to bolster NIH funding and, generally speaking, science research funding. We must continue to support predictable and efficient FDA regulatory processes to ensure that safe products get to patients as quickly as possible. And increasingly, we must focus on the establishment of appropriate coverage, payment, and access policies within Medicare and other uh, mechanisms. And we must also continue to maintain robust IP and patent protections, uh, both here in the United States and in our trade talks overseas. Here in California, certainly we have the, the foundation of our world-leading uh, research universities and research institutes, but we must continue to strongly support higher education and higher education funding here in California. We must continue to support and increase science and math funding at all levels. And we must continue to foster a better, uh, more predictable tax, regulatory, and lawsuit climate in our state. That, actually, that will conclude the, the key findings of our report. 
And I'd like to remind everyone who is participating in the webcast, if you have a question, please submit those into the questions tab on the lower right-hand side of your webinar control panel. As we turn to our panel discussion, I'd like to start things off with Rick Winningham, the chairman and CEO of TheraVance Biopharma and CHI's board chairman. So Rick, you've had the chance to look at these numbers. Um, what do you think this means for California's biopharmaceutical sector? Yeah, thanks, Todd. Well, I think that I think overall the uh, the numbers are encouraging uh, for California. Uh, I think the growth, uh, the overall growth and progress in employment uh, since the uh, you know since the dark days of of 2008 are obviously quite encouraging. I think the company formation uh, information uh, of uh, biotechnology companies uh, specifically is also very encouraging, and I want to draw uh, uh, some. To attention back to something that Peter said, you know the NIH, uh, the NIH funding is really critical uh, for creating uh, the basic feedstock uh, for uh, biomedical innovation. Uh, that in the NIH funding and the creation of that feedstock uh, then is leveraged largely by entrepreneurs and venture capitalists in order to begin the process of uh, biomedical innovation that can bring value to patients. But that's only at the very beginning. Uh, many, many, many of those companies are, that are formed are not successful. Uh, some are and then progress into, uh, into uh, testing in, in human clinical trials. Their products uh, that so, and, and this is so well outlined in terms of California by the California products by therapeutic area on page three of the report. Uh, with, without the basic funding that we've had uh, in NIH and specifically in the NCI, starting all the way back in the early 1990s, uh, the filing of these INDs in cancer, as an example, would not have been possible today. They also would not have been possible without the extraordinary risk that the venture capital uh, community has taken uh, to start these companies, as well as the entrepreneurs themselves uh, have taken in, in starting these companies that lead to these INDs. But this is, again, this is only the beginning uh, of the process. Uh, we then move to something that Todd said, which is the regulatory environment, uh, working through and providing uh, proof of, of safety uh, uh, and efficacy of these medicines. Uh, and then we, we progress from there uh, to making these medicines, if successful, uh, available to physicians and patients. So I think the NIH funding, uh, that uh, is a critical piece. The company formation is a critical piece. The capital availability uh, that we have for companies in California, as, as uh, Peter mentioned, through the IPO <laughs> market, uh, is, has, been, has been critical at fostering biomedical innovation and getting that biomedical innovation from the beginning of the process to actually be benefiting uh, patients, and because that's what we're about here in the biomedical industry. At the end of the day, we have to have uh, biomedical inter inter interventions that benefit patients, and I think the rich ecosystem that exists in California, from smart minds uh, to smart money to long-term view, is, is well exemplified in this report, and I, I think the plus is the California environment is strong. The caution is, as Todd said, uh, fa past performance is no indication of, of future performance. Uh, success is fragile, and we need to continue to try and advocate for the right public policies to strengthen the system that has brought forth these, uh, these therapeutic advances. Thanks so much, Rick. Uh, to obtain the perspective from the medical device community in California, I'd like to turn to Don Bobo, Corporate Vice President of Heart Valve Therapy for Edwards Life Sciences. Don, over 1,500 medical device companies in California. More medical device companies, more medical device jobs in California than, than any other state in the nation. So some really good uh, elements to the story in our report. Um, given your experience, given your knowledge, uh, what, does this, what do these figures mean for the sector and the state? And what are some of those reminders that we need to, to, to really think on and policymakers and others need to think on to ensure that it continues to be vibrant moving forward? Yeah, thanks, Todd. Uh, actually, we were very pleased in this report to see the size of the medical device industry in California as well as the overall sector growth of 4%. I think 
for California to um, be the leader and remain a leader, I think, is incredibly important to the state. We also think it's incredibly important to patients because every one of these companies um, is working very diligently, whether it's medical devices or pharma, to improve the patient experience, and, and we think that's um, an important fact that shouldn't be missed. So it was we were pleased to see this progress, but um, in, in, in a couple of areas, we, we stay concerned. If you look at the growth in the medical device sector in this report, it's been largely flat. And I think that's, if we go back uh, five or ten years, it probably wasn't flat. It was probably a, a much stronger grower. So we've got a big footprint. We have a lot of great things going on. Uh, but we worry on a couple of levels. First of all, our greatest source of innovation is the venture capital funding of small companies. Uh, where they take ideas out of universities, they take ideas from entrepreneurs, um, they risk capital, and they find a path through the regulatory and the payment system to actually deliver a therapy to patients. And we've seen that um, uh, venture capital footprint in med tech uh, go down significantly over the past five years. There's a, a number of reports out there, but if you look at the venture capital uh, reporting that that industry looks at, they would say it's down 40 percent. We've probably reached the lowest level in two decades. So while that doesn't change 13, 14, or 15, uh, that's a early warning of what we're facing in the next five to 10 years when we think about um, additional ideas that are planted, that are funded, and that become important sources of innovation going forward. So that that's concerning, and that's something we, we hope we can, uh, as a collective policy group with the state with the feds um, do something about that. I, I think if you talk to the the folks that risk capital for these ventures, they mention two things that are very problematic. One is the regulatory pathway has become less clear, more uncertain, and much more burdensome. And the payment system, the certainty of payment, uh, even when you land innovation with great clinical data, you have a whole nother battle on your front, uh, on your hand around payment. So anything we do to uh, make the risk-reward equation clearer by improving our culture and regulatory and, and the payment side, um, we think would open up additional investment from venture capital into medical device into the medical device um, segment. And we, this is incredibly important because this is an industry that California leads for the nation and the U.S. leads for the world. And so I think it needs to be an industry that we take seriously, that we incubate, that we um, spend time making sure that we have the opportunity to stay in a leadership position. Edwards Life Sciences is very proud to have been started in California. We're headquartered in California. We've been here over 50 years. Um, we are uh, the leader in and the uh, innovator of heart valve therapies for patients. So we actually uh, deliver products that, that uh, actually extend life and keep people alive. Uh, we're very pleased to be part of the California ecosystem. We're very passionate to continue to make sure that stays strong. Uh, we do think there are opportunities, though, to improve, and we hope that as we as this report goes through and influences policymakers, both at the state and the federal level, uh, there they find the ability to partner to improve the regulatory system, the payment system, and in, be an encourager of the venture capital uh, funding. Thank you, Don. Um, so that actually concludes our the formal presentation. We're going to switch over to uh, to Q and A now. Um, you know, Rick and Don, we've we've chatted on uh, some of the some of the challenges, some of the headwinds we're facing. Um, I was wondering if you might each uh, identify, maybe at a little bit more particular level, some of your key concerns facing uh, the biopharmaceutical sector, facing the med tech sector to ensure that w we do remain strong. In particular, the kind of from the, from the policy angle, you know, what are some of your most particular significant concerns at a policy level uh, that we need to further delve into to ensure that at the end of the day, we get policies constructed in Washington and in Sacramento so that we talk about this report next year, five years from now, ten years from now, we can say that it continues to be a vibrant, critical part of our state's economy. So, uh, you know, at least from the, from the biotech, uh, uh, biopharma perspective, I think I'd, I'd probably uh, hone in on two, first of which, and 
you know, they're not they're not terribly different. I think between biotechnology and and med tech. Uh, the first is uh, a, a, a predictable uh, regulatory environment. Uh, I think that uh, we made considerable progress within within the biopharma uh, sector over the past uh, five plus years or so uh, with uh, Im improving uh, predictability of, of uh, the regulatory process with regard to uh, you know FDA uh, decision points. Uh, the uh, the now availability of a breakthrough therapy designation for those uh, for those important medicines that gets uh, senior members of the FDA involved more quickly uh, in the prosecuting of, of very important medicines that uh, that that really have a chance to to, to change uh, human health either in specific populations, small populations, or broader populations. So I think the we, but again we can't stop where we are because the science and medicine is becoming more complex and our population in the United States and in the globe is aging and that will po pose greater and greater challenges uh, for uh, the health care of that aging population so the progress has to continue to be made at a greater and greater rate so that's the sort of the regulatory process and how it relates to the Food and Drug uh, Administration I think secondly and this is picking again on something Don said uh, is the reimbursement environment. Uh, you know, one has to be very careful uh, in the reimbursement env environment of equating value and cost, okay, because many of the interventions that the biomedical community brings forward, in fact, may, may that particular intervention may cost more at the point of sale, but in fact, the adoption of that innovation reduces overall health care costs and improves the outcomes and the lives of patients. So cost doesn't uh, e always equal value, and one has to be very careful uh, it, in the reimbursement system of focusing on value and not cost alone. Doug? I'll um, just amplify what Rick has, has mentioned. One of the things I'd like to um, actually compliment is the House Energy and Commerce Committee 21st Century Careers Initiative. We've are, we've already seen progress from that, um, and we've enjoyed a much closer collaboration with our regulators in Washington, and have had the ability to begin a conversation out around a risk-based approach to uh, starting many of our device activities in the U.S. Up to now, we generally start all of our early phase work in medical devices outside the U.S., and that's resulted in the U.S approvals lagging the rest of the world by two generations of products. And we just think we can do better than that um, because we still go through the same rigor of safety and, and proof points that you need to for these products. And so we, we would just encourage um, our California delegation and our folks in Washington to continue to value this path of improvement that came out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee's work um, and to make sure that we as a collective industry, FDA and, and medical devices actually continue to move that forward. And the last comment I'll, I'll make on the reimbursement front, we talk a lot about innovation and you know there are examples of innovation that actually extend life. And we still end up in long, multi-year, complicated conversations trying to figure out how to make room for that and how to handle that. We think there's probably um, you know dialogue and policy that could be uh, influence that would make that a much less burdensome process. Thanks, Don. You know, I'm going to maybe follow up uh, with another question to you. You mentioned it in your your opening remarks. Um, you know, we have seen over the entire life sciences sector in California um, some some real job growth. The the med tech space for the past year or two has been relatively flat. We haven't been uh, bleeding jobs, um, but there's a lot more that could be done, certainly given the excitement in the types of technologies we're seeing being developed here in California. So you, are, are there any things you might point to uh, the business climate here in California, other elements here in California, or again at the federal level, that we need to focus on to, to best help drive employment growth uh, in the medical technology sector, yeah, Todd, it, it's it's um, it's the right question. And as we talk to a lot of our our partners that are in the business of venture capital and early stage small companies, 
Um, I'd say the, the first place they go when they take investment down is the risk-reward equation is difficult because they don't have clarity on the regulatory and the payment side. So I think first order for them would be let's continue to partner together to make the, the risk-reward and the clarity around regulatory process and payment um, uh, just much clearer. They're willing to risk capital. What gets tough is if you risk capital for seven years and then the whole approach changes and you've got another seven years you have to you have to invest to get to the then new standard. So I think that's number one. As it relates to California, I would just encourage us as an industry in California to continue to value um, sectors and jobs where uh, they employ a lot of creators. A lot of what goes on in this industry, there's invention, there's creation, they're developing new markets, they're developing new approaches to therapy, and that's in contrast to other sectors, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a vibrant and valuable sector that attracts the, probably the kind of talent and the kind of folks we'd like to have in the state. Thanks again. So, you know, I'll um, open this up again to maybe to to Rick and to, to, to Peter, what do you think in particular in the, the biopharmaceutical space, what is, what is driving the, the resurgence, both in terms of venture capital funding and uh, the number of IPOs we've seen, some, some significant excitement? Um, but so what, what's driving that, and are there any kind of caveats to uh, be aware of in terms of what the, the environment like, might look like throughout this year and heading into a new year? Well, I think clearly in the, what's driving investment uh, from the venture capital community is, is extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, development of great scientific ideas uh, that, that have the possibility to turn into meaningful uh, biotechnology products to benefit uh, human health, I, I, and I think you know it's sort of. And again, I'd go back. This is a this is a, a twenty year uh, twenty year process. Many of these uh, ideas began uh, with uh, funding uh, of the NIH and the and the NCI uh, in the early nineteen nineties. Uh, we saw rapid growth in NCI funding for in the in the nineteen nineties. Understanding, if you take cancer as an example. Uh, some of the molecular bases uh, for the development of many different types of cancers. And then it became, well, how are you going to develop uh, a product to take advantage of this biological knowledge? And I think where, where what we found ourselves today is that we're, we're at that point after you know, 15, 20 years of, of investing uh, by both the public and the private sector where there are a lot of great ideas to pursue uh, in making a difference, whether it's in cancer, whether it's infectious disease, whether it's in neurological disorders that affect the aging population. Uh, and, the, and the venture capital community sees these exciting ideas and wants to fund them with the understanding that many of them are not going to be successful. However, one or two may be. And I think it's the promise of the science that has brought in the capital. So. Yeah, and just adding on to what Rick had said, you know, I, I think one, one element that's driving it is just that exit activity and opportunities have increased, um, whether it be through M&A, whether it be through the IPO market but there's more ability to be able to reap the benefit of those investments. And when you look at the nadir of funding back in the, you know, the 2011 time frame, those avenues were really closed. And now when you look at it, you look back to the levels. We're back to the levels now that we haven't seen since 2008. And 2007 is really the only year in history that's beat what we've seen so far this year. But to the points that both Don and Rick made, you know, the growth is in the companies who have the opportunity to exit, so the later stage companies. Um, and not as much in the early stage companies who will generate that next generation of of companies over the next five years. So I think that's an important thing to to focus on. So I'm going to take it back uh, the conversation back to the very early stages of uh, the innovation pipeline, which are our states, research universities, and research institutes. And, and Rick, you've you've touched on this a couple of times, but as we show in our report. Not only are our state's research universities, the UC system, Stanford, our private research institutes, the, the recipients of 
NIH funding, that research hopefully ultimately results in not only advances in science, but, but new technologies that will ultimately be spun out into the private, private sector. I would ask, would ask both of you, Rick and Don, to maybe speak to the, just the critical importance of that element of our infrastructure and the, the role it plays in continuing to drive research. You know, in Irvine, obviously, you see Irvine right there in Edwards' backyard. You see San Francisco, Stanford right in the backyard here in, in, the, in the greater, in the Bay Area. Um, do policymakers understand the significance of the partnership between industry and the, and the research community? And what, what might we do to, to promote uh, that appreciation, that understanding, so that, that the seed corn uh, that comes from that element of our ecosystem uh, continues to remain vibrant? So, relative to the question on on appreciation, I, I think by and large, the, the, the you know communicating uh, the understanding of of how the biomedical innovation ecosystem works uh, to policymakers is 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 a, is more or less a nonstop activity. So, no, I don't I don't I, I think it's complex. Uh, I think it takes a lot of education to to really understand how important. You know, each step in the process is an investment in each step of the process is in creating the right environment, whether it's for public monies uh, going in via NIH funding uh, or, or, pri or, or private capital going in to, to start companies and, and move technologies forward closer to the point where they can benefit patients. Now, the importance of the, uh, of the uh, research institutions in California I see them as, as sort of threefold. One of them is the, the generation of ideas themselves that come out of the academic community. The second is the generation that off of those ideas, the technology of which the early stages might be present within those research institutions. And third, and one point that we don't talk about very much, are the people. The people that come out of uh, the academic research uh, centers and, and the, these really, uh, you know, pantheons of excellence that we have in California uh, that become uh, the great scientific leader within a company, the great entrepreneur uh, within a company. Uh, and when you link those three together, ideas, technology, and terrific people, I think that's a bit of why California uh, has been successful uh, in this endeavor and why we stand at the top right now of sort of the biomedical innovation uh, ecosystem in terms of states. Now, I think that's under, you know, it, 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 we're under extraordinary threat from that uh, internationally. I, I think if you look at the investments, uh, for one, that China's placing in their biomedical innovation ecosystem, they are extraordinary uh, relative to uh, where they've been historically. Uh, so, I, I, again, this is a point that both Don made, I made. You know, we can't sit and rest on our, on our laurels, uh, that uh, this, this system and, and really the mix that's what made California strong, we can't sit on our laurels and think that's going to continue forever. Don? Yeah, I just, uh, uh, Rick, I agree with the way you laid that out. That was very helpful. Um, I think there's two points I would make. One is that I think education leads innovation. When you prioritize education and you make it a big deal in the state and you give great choices for our students in the state, then I think that's a early investment and that'll turn into stronger innovation on all the dimensions. Um, the second thing that we experience is it's also an important source of independent ideas. You know, when you're in a corporate entity, you've got your initiatives and you've got your R&D programs and your funding, and they tend to very quickly end up in a development path. What's beautiful about the industry, the the, uh, the universities and the private research institutions, and the reason it's important for them to be well funded, is they're able to think broader and bigger, not constrained by a development timeline. So we actively interact with a lot of these groups, and they often become the uh, catalyst for ideas that we may have thought of, but we didn't find the time in our budgets and our development because we're trying to get something out to the market. Um, and I think that's a very important and healthy part that needs to be um, nurtured 
cherished and built. I also think uh, one of the strengths of CHI is that we've got a lot of the universities that sit with us as we look at broader policies and how to make this sector stronger. Thanks, Don. And that actually will conclude our, uh, our presentation and our discussion today. I want to again thank uh, Rick Winningham and Don Bobo for, for joining us and of course our report co-author and, and partner uh, Peter Claude. We hope that you've all found today's webcast to be informative. If you haven't had a chance to check out our full report, please visit www.chi.org uh, and click on the banner in the middle of the page. Also, if you have any questions that we were unable to address in this webcast, uh, please send them to our communications manager, Will Zazadny at Zazadny, that's Z-A-S-A-D-N-Y at chi.org. A recording of this webinar will be available on chi.org next week. Again, thank you for joining us for this report launch.